Welcome back and today I'm going to be looking at this ultrasonic sensor which appears in a whole load of robotic um, sort of amateur projects and things. It's the HC SR04 and it's got four pins on it. If you look closely at what the pins are they will say that a VCC that's plus five volts a trigger, echo and ground. So uh, what we have to do here, there it is there, VCC, trigger, echo and ground. According to the data sheet of the device, we have to apply it with a 10 microsecond pulse. And that is into the trigger input. And then it responds with an 8 cycle sonic burst. That's about 40 kilohertz, which of course you can't hear. And then the echo comes back which is a pulse and the width of the echo is proportional to the distance. In fact the width is the time taken to get to the target and back again. So we have to be able to do two things. Firstly generate an accurate 10 microsecond pulse and secondly once we've got the echo we've got to feed it back in again to our device and measure the width. And the way I'm doing this is I'm going to use a my reel of course and if I look at, I'm going to use the FPGA to do the 10 microsecond pulse and do the measurements so to get the 10 microsecond pulse I've got a loop here on its own it's a sort of running in parallel with another one the loop here runs at 100 Hertz and that's fast enough for scanning really when you're moving around a small robot it's I mean, if you had very maybe a very fast supersonic aircraft or something, of course, it's nowhere near fast enough, but it's fast enough for very small robots. So uh, that's running at 100 hertz. So I put a timer in the loop, which is uh, here, and I set that up to 100 hertz. That's 10,000 microseconds, I think. Yeah. And then we have this uh, sequence. So the f first part of the sequence is it sets the output here which is DI0 uh, to high for 10 microseconds and then low again so that it's off again and then it repeats itself and that will produce our uh, loop, uh, our, our 10 microsecond pulse and if we look on the oscilloscope we should be able to see it there it is it's not triggering that well at the moment but can see it there and above it you'll see uh, the received pulse that comes back from the device I just put it straight onto the and you'll see that its uh, width will vary I'm going to put my hand here in front of the device and you'll see that the width varies sometimes a little bit on the noisy side if it doesn't get a good target so if I put this um, piece of paper in front it gives a better target and as I bring it down pulses get narrower and as I bring it up the pulses get wider down and up and if I let it go completely so and it's basically just bouncing off the ceiling and I was quite surprised to see that it's it's not too bad even measuring the height of the ceiling so it's supposed to work up to four meters and the height of the ceiling is about just over two meters and it does work remarkably well. The only thing we have to be able to do is to measure the width of the pulse so I take the output of the echo and I send it back into the my Rio and I read it via the FPGA and so I need a second loop and for this I'm going to use a very fast loop a 40 megahertz loop uh, which I can do of course because it's an FPGA that's uh, one of the nice things about it. And I got this bit of code from National Instruments. It's uh, freely available. They tell you how to do this, how to measure the width of a pulse. And basically, um, it's not too difficult. It, it um, your, your clock's going at 40 megahertz. So one tick you can work out. That's like uh, one over 40 times 10 to the uh, six, the duration of one tick. And it's four, so it's got 40 million ticks in a second so there should be plenty of resolution there to catch it to measure the length of the pulse very accurately 
And so what it does, the instructions down here, it says, was, is there a change in the input value? Uh, and if there was, was it a high to a low? Um, was there a high to low change? So was there a low to high? Was there a high to low? Calculate the time elapsed since the last timestamp. If there was no changes, record the current tick count as the current timestamp. If there was a low to high, set the low period equal to the current time elapsed. If there was a high, a high to low change, set the high period equal to the current time elapsed. That's uh, down on the comments of this. Uh, so there's, there is it reading in because I've sent the, uh, I've connected externally to DIO1, and so uh, that gets read in and it goes to a register and I take the previous value of the register and I take the difference and that and it's all in what they call ticks uh, nowadays. Uh, notice the stop on this has to be a variable connected to the main stop. We don't use two stops. Um, that's um, local variable I think it is. I got that right. Let's just check. Um, you just do create local variable. Yes, it's a local variable. So you create a local variable, and then you drive the um, your switch into the local variable as a read, and then you read it as a write, and then you read it to stop that one, and you read it again to stop that one. So that's your local variable. So when you've got that running, um, you need a little formula later to convert it into. Um, uh, into centimeters, but oh, I've changed it, so I'll have to recompile it again. Uh, so uh, you'll have to bear with me. So, so we need to compile it, and once it's compiled, then we will uh, go to the to the main part of the program, which will over here. And what? Just wait till it does that for a moment, and it'll take about maybe five minutes, ten minutes to compile, so I won't bore you with the compile bit. And over on the main program um, we set a reference, so this is in the real-time controller, we set a reference to the target. Uh, we have to do this as an invoke method, which just tells it to run. Now we have a real-time loop uh, which is um, running around um, this is, I don't need this, this is from another program uh, so it's running round at um, I think it's running round at about uh, 10 kilohertz or something but it, again it doesn't have to be that fast and this read write control reads the value of the width of the pulse and then it does some scaling and it gives us the distance. So I'll just wait till the uh, comp compilation's done and I'll be right back. Well, while we're waiting for it to compile, uh, just a few sums here. Um, there's the width of the received pulse, if I call it TD, and uh, I get the get it in microseconds, and that's twice the time I actually need because it's going to the destination and back, to the target and back. Um, there's a sort of magic number here which we can calculate. The speed of sound is 340. Where does it get it focused? The speed of sound is 340 meters per second, and that's uh, 34,000 centimeters per second. Or we can write that one second per 10 to the 6 microseconds, and in the end that gives us um, 0.0. Trying to get it on the camera here, 0 0.034 centimeters per microsecond, and that in turn becomes 29.4 microseconds per centimeter, which we have to multiply by two, and it gives us 59 microseconds per centimeter, uh, and that gives us one over 59 centimeters per microsecond. Okay, so it's a little bit of uh, arithmetic 1 over 59 centimeters per microsecond so if we multiply by microseconds we get uh, centimeters so we must divide through by 59 uh, any thing we get and uh, that'll give us the, um, the distance in centimeters so that's it finished compiling
and I'll now go to the real time part and it should now run and I've put a distance sort of meter on there, a dial and that's in another readout in meters in centimeters rather so run it and you'll see it's just sitting there looking at the ceiling at the moment so it's reading 200 and well I have to say 219 centimeters or something like that and, and I uh, just so happen to have a tape measure here and I, so I stuck that up to the ceiling and the ceiling's about 215 centimeters but I didn't measure it that accurately so if we put something in front of the sensor now like this we can see the um, you see the arrow the gauge rather changing so there it is at 40 centimeters so that should be about 40 centimeters from the sensor and I have measured this and it's it's pretty damn good actually um, and as I go up you can see that's my hand going up coming down over here the gauge is changing showing the distance in height and it does get a bit funny when you you're sort of between two objects that's when it gets noisy like that so uh, it likes a, a nice surface so that because of that it's good for walls uh, but you know if it's trying to find its way between smaller objects it might have difficulty and you might get these kind of um, jitter uh, in it uh, as because it's ultrasound uh, there are better ways and my colleague tells me we should be using uh, as infrared ways which are a little bit better don't suffer from the same problems and if you've got lots of money, of course, you can go for, on a big device, you can go for radar uh, type uh, uh, approach. Okay, so uh, that's uh, how to use a MyRio with an ultrasound device, uh, at least my solution. It's not the only way to do it, of course. There probably you could use a real-time controller more rather than the FPGA, but that's the way I've done it this way. Like all these solutions, there's always more than one way to do it. Thank you. See you the next time.